Good morning, Sardis. I'm delighted to see you, those that are here today, and to welcome those also who are watching from home or on our live stream. I'd like to invite you to stand and sing with us our opening song today. We have a story to tell to the nations. Good morning, Sardis Church family. It is so good to see everyone here. You know, each week uh, it seems to grow a little bit more. I guess we're starting to finally get back to some sense of, of normalcy, whatever that is for you. I don't know, but, uh, but it's good to see everyone here today. And if you are a visitor with us, we especially welcome you uh, into our church service this morning. And when you came in, I hope you received a bulletin. And on that bulletin, there's a little tear-off. If you would just fill that out and jot down a little information about yourself, we would, uh, we would indeed uh, uh, deem that an honor of to be able to contact you and to maybe come visit with you. And if you would turn it in to Pastor Rich, I think he's going to be in the back at the end of the service. They have a little gift bag for you uh, that you can uh, give him that card. He'll give you that gift bag and just a small token of our appreciation for you being here with us today. Well, today is a special day for us. We have uh, we got a lot we're going to cram into our uh, service today. And uh, today we have a special uh, presentation from the Gideons. Everybody, I'm sure, is familiar with them. And so I'm going to invite Boomer up to come up and introduce uh, our speaker uh, this morning uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Pastor. It's uh, really my pleasure to uh, be here today. As our other Gideons here along with myself, and uh, I want to be introducing Rhonda's husband, uh, <laughs> Thomas. Uh, everybody should know him. Uh, as you know, he was uh, in the real estate, I mean, the re retail business quite some time. 
and then uh, joined the Gideons, and, uh, and not because he joined the Gideons, but uh, as you know, he serves as a magistrate judge. So we have a real pleasure of having him here. And before we bring him up, I want to mention one thing that I always do when I talk about uh, the Gideons, and that's this little Bible. It's very inexpensive. Your donation today will print these Bibles. We don't use the money for anything else but printing Bibles. And it's a mission. Just think, if you bought a Bible and went to a foreign country or even here in America, and you changed that person's life and you accepted Jesus Christ, you may not know it, but God knows it. Thomas, come on up and give your presentation. And give him a big welcome here. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning, and I'll be real brief. I look around and I see family, I see friends, so I feel right at home at Sardis. Sardis, as I grew up as a kid and a, a child down at the little old church in Milltown, used to come right across the street here and play basketball. That was the grandest thing. As I got older, I realized how close that court was to the walls, but we had a grand time with that. I'm going to be really brief this morning. I, I really appreciate Pastor Kimberly to allow a, a brief moment uh, to share with you the Giddish ministry. And uh, I, I was thinking a moment ago, when I was a child and a Gideon was coming to Milltown Baptist Church, I would shudder because they were the most boring people that I'd ever heard. <laughs> Me, my brother, and my two sisters would all moan and mom would pop every one of us at the same time. But to share real quickly, a, a, a dear friend of mine, Mr. Bill McSwain, you probably remember Mr. Bill, passed on now. Mr. Bill told this true story, and it not only happened to him, it's happened to others. Mr. Bill McSwain arrived early at his assignment church one morning, and he was sitting in the parking lot in his car, and a few minutes later he said that a driver come in, and Mr. Bill got out of his car. The driver came across the lot and came to him, and he said, are you visiting with us today? Mr. Bill said, I sure am. He said, I hate to tell you, but we got a Gideon speaker coming. <laughs> Founded in 1898, when two Christian businessmen met sharing coffee at a motel in Wisconsin, returned a few weeks later with two other Christian businessmen and palm placing Bibles in each room, Thus, the Gideon ministry was organized. Today, Christian men, professional and independent from all walks of life, farmers, manufacturing supervisors, business owners, make up Gideon International, whose sole goal is to continue to spread God's word into the uttermost parts of the world. There are over 175,000 Gideons internationally in over 200 countries with scriptures being translated into over 101 languages. Gideon Bibles are being presented and placed in every village, every town, city. They're placed in areas God opens the doors. Gideon Bibles are being placed in motels, hotels, condos, banks, hospitals, doctor's offices, schools, government buildings, jails, prisons, and always into our schools. Last year, there were more than 91 million scriptures just be distributed with more than 80 million sent overseas. Now listen to this, I want to share with you real briefly. 3.6 million Bibles have been distributed in China alone. Now the sad story is we do not have a clue how long that will be available. Three countries we are not in. Afghanistan, Iran, and Iraq. I want to share with you today that it's only by the prayers and the gifts from you that enable these triumphs to exist. Each of you have made a direct impact in someone's life as these Bibles are being distributed. As Brother Boomer shared a moment ago, this is a little what we call 
the personal worker's testimony. It's a little brown Bible. In it, we do our markings, we wear it out, we tear it out, we beat it up pretty good, and then we give it away and we get another one. But in every little New Testament that's placed in some place or in someone's hand, in the front pages it tells what the Bible is, contains the mind of God, the state of the man, the way of salvation. In the back, it gives a little place to share the testimony, the love of Jesus, and to record their name. Also on that back page, as I like to share with everyone, there's a little phrase that calls sick in the church. Gideon encouraged every one that accepts Jesus Christ to find a local church to be a part of. The little orange Bible you see everywhere you go in the schools. The sad news is we're not in Hart County High School, or excuse me, elementary schools where we place these. But you know what? Satan doesn't have the victory. Y'all do all the little backpacks. Y'all ever done the backpacks and things of that nature? Anytime something is gathered and put together for children taken out on a mission field, Gideon Bibles are placed in those backpacks wherever they go. Anytime there's an organization on the streets of Hartwell that's having any kind of festival, Gideon Bibles are being stripped. One of my favorite Bibles is this one right here. That's the one that goes into the hotels and the motels, but it also goes into hospitals. By a hospital Bible, I led my, I led my dad to a saving knowledge of Jesus. In closing, have you ever had the electricity to go off in the darkest of night? You maneuvered around and you found that candle and you lit that wick. That small light in the darkness brings forth a power that we take for granted. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If Jesus is in each of us, and we are in him, then we are to be that light and let that light shine. Thank you very much.
Amen. Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, I want to invite you to be making your way to the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, we're going to be looking this morning at one passage of Scripture. And you have come on a special day. Today I have actually two many sermons to preach uh, to you today. Two shorter sermons, and all God's people said, yeah, right, right, you know. Uh, but I do have two things to say. I'm going to preach this message in Revelation, and then I'm going to come back up uh, and I have some other things to talk to you about. So I uh, beg your endurance and patience uh, today as we go through uh, everything that needs uh, to be gone through, and, uh, and we'll give God the glory for it all. Revelation chapter 1, and in verse 11, it's a passage we looked at a couple of weeks ago. John receives this command from the Lord. He says, write what you see in the book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you so much. Lord, we thank you, first of all, for the grace and the mercy of God that you have shown us today, and God, in every day of our life, Lord, you give us much more than we ever deserve. You withhold from us, Father, that which we do deserve. Lord, you do not treat us as our sins uh, demand, but God, you extend grace to us, and we thank you for that. And Lord, we do ask today as we come and as we open up your word and as we talk, Father, about all that you have done and all that, Lord, we pray you will do. God, may it all be for the sole purpose of glorifying and making much of our Savior. Father, may it be for the salvation of people and for the discipleship and for the sanctification of, of your people. So Lord, bless our time this morning. Thank you again for allowing us the privilege of being here. And as we have been reminded already, this is not true for people in many parts of our world. But God, you've given us grace here, so may... We make the most of it. Uh, again, for your glory and our good, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it is not unusual for leadership in any church uh, to meet uh, periodically for the purpose of evaluating uh, the, the ministry of the church, the effectiveness of the ministry of the church, and also to look at even the the individual ministries of the church and do some evaluation on those things. It's not unusual for that to happen. As a matter of fact, I would say it's a dereliction of duty not uh, to do that, not to make such evaluations. You know, the leadership in our church has gone through such a process back in January. Uh, we gathered together, myself and the deacons and some of the trustees, gathered together and had some time away and had an opportunity to talk and to evaluate and, and do some things. And uh, the result of that evaluation led us to what we looked at or what we proposed last week. Again, two components that we agree needed uh, to be focused on and be considered are two very important aspects of the life of our church. That is, the ministry of our adult ministry and also of our children's ministry. And then we talked about needing some tools to be able to make that happen. And so we talked about the remodel of that uh, building over there as, as to, to make it better and more accommodating uh, for children and adults and everything. And so basically so it doesn't fall to the ground. And so we proposed that. You know, and as I was thinking <clears throat> about all of that this past week, and as I've been studying through uh, these seven letters to these seven churches, reading through there, studying through these letters, I couldn't help but wonder. I couldn't help but wonder what if. All right? What if it were Jesus who made the evaluation of our church and not us? All right? What if Jesus said in the meeting back in January and told us what <clears throat> he thought uh, about the condition of our church. What if? What if Jesus were the one 
to make that evaluation. If Jesus were to write a letter to our church, like he did to these seven churches, what do you think he would say? What do you think he would say? <clears throat> or think about it this way. What if the sovereign Lord of the universe, the all-knowing God of creation, whose, as Scripture says, eyes are like a flame of fire, and he sees through it all. What if the risen Christ himself wrote us a letter addressing the strengths and weaknesses of our church? What do you think he would say? What do you think he would say? Now, I would submit to you this, no matter what he says, or whatever he would say, it would certainly be beneficial, wouldn't it? No doubt. But I would submit to you, it'd probably be a little uncomfortable too, wouldn't it? Might make us a little uncomfortable. Because here's why. As hard as we might try, as hard as we try, we are still fallen, sinful people who oftentimes don't see things as we should. We are still fallen, sinful people who oftentimes put self first. Right? Hard as we may try not to. Sin still runs rampant in our life. It still is there. The leadership in every church, not just this one, but every church that exists and ever has existed, the leadership in all those churches is comprised of fallible and fallen men who, as hard as they might try not to, still struggle with sin. Starting right here with this one. Who's talking to you? Just a reality of life. And so these realities most certainly affect the church. You know, and I just wonder what would happen if Jesus wrote us a letter like he did to these seven churches in Asia Minor. I don't know, but I believe I would be scared to death to read it. Because I know I'm going to be the one held responsible for what it says. It would scare me to death probably to read it. You see, what we have here in these letters uh, to these seven churches is really Jesus' evaluation, not just of these seven churches here, but really it's His evaluation of all churches down through the ages. And so this morning, I simply want to, what I want to do uh, in, the, in the time we have, I simply want to do kind of a, an overview of these letters, uh, sort of a mini survey if you will just kind of talk to you a little bit about the significance of these letters and how they might relate uh, to us uh, today and where we are starting next week we will begin to systematically walk through each one of these letters and each one of these churches and we will see what the spirit says uh, to the churches so first first thing I want to do is just <clears throat> kind of Give some clarification, okay? Just kind of let you know where I'm coming from as it pertains to these churches, how I understand these churches to be, and how that might differ uh, from uh, maybe what you've heard or what you've been taught over the years. Now, I know there are people who hold to a view that these churches are representing various uh, stages of the universal church from the days of the apostles down through the return of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, some people say there's different dispensations, okay? And each church represents a different uh, dispensation. Maybe you've heard that kind of language. Let me give you an example of what uh, they mean. Uh, the church in Ephesus, which is the first church mentioned here in chapter 2. There are those who see that the church in Ephesus was really the church of the first century. Uh, it represents the church in the first century, right? When the church was being developed, uh, being started, that's what Ephesus represents. And as you keep walking through the churches, they represent different periods. For instance, Smyrna. The church in Smyrna would represent the period during the persecution under Rome. Right? Keep walking through the church in Pergamum. That represented the church in the age of Constantine. That was a time of the Roman peace. Right? When the church was kind of flourishing in those times. The church in Thyatira represents the church during the Middle Ages. The church in Sardis would represent the church during the Reformation. And the church in Philadelphia would represent the time when the church during what some call the age of 
revivals, or some say it's probably that time when the a modern missionary movement began. Guys like William Carey and, and, and those guys. And then, of course, you have the church in Laodicea. And that's the apostate church. That church will exist in the final days before Christ returns. And there are those who believe that we are in that dispensation. We are in that age. This is the Laodicean church. And they say this, this view of how these churches are understood. It's very common among some a dispensationalists. Not all of them, but certainly some of them hold to this view. One writer who holds to this position describes it this way. And listen carefully. He says, the order, the order of the messages to the churches seems to be divinely selected to give uh, prophecy or to prophesy of the main movement of the church down through history. Okay? And so essentially what they're claiming here is that the order that the churches are in, the, they claim the order that the churches are listed is evidence of their view. Think of it this way. The churches and the way they're ordered is somewhat of a prophetic calendar, if you will. A prophetic timeline. Right? We've gone from the first century church in Ephesus... And now we've made it all the way to Laodicea, which is the end times, and Christ is to return. And so there's somewhat of a prophetic calendar. And they say that the order that the churches are in gives credibility to that view. However, it's not necessarily true. Here's what you need to know. Historically, we understand that this order that these churches are in are nothing more than a mail route. It's a mail route. The church in Ephesus was the church on the coast. It was kind of the hub. It was the main church. All the people came from the coast. They came into Ephesus. And this route goes up and around in a a clockwise position. It's a mail route. That's the way things were delivered. That was a common path for them to go. We know that from church history. It's as simple as that. So it may not be a prophetic calendar. It may just be the way they listed it because that's the mail route. That's the way that these letters are going to be distributed. Okay, so there's that. Now, I tell you all that because some of you may have been taught this more dispensational view. All right, I'm not going to bash it or anything. I'm just letting you know where I'm coming from. Baptist people have a wide variety of beliefs, especially when it comes to the book of Revelation and especially when it comes to prophecy and end time stuff. They're all over the place. When it comes to that, we're, we're, as Baptist folk, we're a little bit schizophrenic, if you will, in some of our uh, theology when it comes to this stuff. Again, there's a whole lot of different views, especially when it comes to the book of Revelation. And so I thought I would tell you all this because it's going to be important for you to know at least where I'm coming from as we walk through, uh, as we walk through these letters. And hopefully that will help you better understand uh, what I'm saying. I'm trying to give you a lens through which to look as I'm going to be teaching through these. Now, you may have guessed by now, I don't affirm the dispensational view, that prophetic calendar view. I don't uh, affirm that at all concerning these churches. I believe that interpretation stretches the text a little bit. I think it stretches history a little bit. I don't think it's grounded uh, in history or the text. I think it's a little bit arbitrary in terms of how they come up with it. All right, so I don't buy into that. So all that to be said, and what do I do? Well, let me just give you this. Uh, if, if what I say and what I teach in terms of coming through this book and going through these seven letters seems a little strange, well, you're going to know why, because it may differ from where you are. Uh, I hold to an older view of interpretation of these seven churches. I hold to a view that really goes back, uh, really, to the... Second century to the patristics, what we call the early church fathers. Many of them held to this position. The the, uh, dispensational view that I explained to you is really the newest view, the the youngest view in terms of church history. Uh, And so my my understanding goes back. I try, just so you know, when I read the Bible and try to understand text, I go back as far as I can. I want to get as close uh, to the first century, to the people who wrote it, as I possibly can. And so I'm very heavily influenced by the early church fathers and some of their writings. Why? Because they were the disciples of the disciples, right? And so they they had some kind of firsthand knowledge. And so 
My view goes back a pretty good ways. And the view I hold takes kind of a broader approach to understanding these letters. Right? Like I said, these seven <clears throat> churches in chapters 2 and 3, they were real churches. They were literal churches. They uh, really exist. They're historical churches. Right? They were churches that really existed with real people who had some real problems and who were going through some real trials. All right? So they were real. And what we're seeing... Here is while not precisely duplicated, these seven churches represent the types of churches that are generally present throughout the church age. Let me put it to you this way. The churches are a, what we would call a composite picture, if you will, of, uh, of conditions that will exist in the church throughout history. Okay, If you don't understand that now, hopefully you will as we, as we walk through it. Let me make it a little more personal. Maybe this will help you. Maybe this will help you understand. <clears throat> we might find ourselves as Sardis Baptist Church here in Hartwell, Georgia, or maybe First Baptist or uh, the Methodist Church. Who you pick a church, but let's just choose us because this is where we are. Uh, we might find ourselves as a church fitting into any one of these seven churches at any given time, or we might find that we represent a little bit of several of these churches. We might, have, we might have a little bit of each one existing in our church at any given time in our history. Think about it like this. Could it be that there was a time when Sardis, here in Hartwell, had abandoned his, uh, her first love? Could there be a time when Sardis had been a stumbling block? Or a time when Sardis had believed itself to be alive, but in reality... It was dead. Or maybe there was a time when Sardis was clicking on all cylinders, right? You were doing it well and doing it fine, right? Any given moment in our history as a church, we could find ourselves parked in any one of these seven churches, right? Help you understand, as one writer put it this way, he said, Nowhere is the old saying, if the shoe fits, wear it, better demonstrated than in these seven churches. We just have to look and see where are we at. Right? And so, in many ways, these seven churches are not so much a, a prophetic timeline as much as they are an example for us to check ourselves and see where we are. That's what they are. That's what they represent. One more reason I've come to this uh, conclusion, just so you know. What we believe we know about these letters, these seven letters, while they were written to individual churches they were not mailed in individual envelopes okay they are part of this larger letter that we know as the book of revelation in other words these messages were not divided and sent to the representative churches but rather they were all sent together to be read aloud to all of the churches this is what we call a a circular letter okay it went to all the churches and so for example the church in uh, Laodicea, they had the, the uh, stuff read to them about the church in Ephesus and the church in Smyrna and so on and so forth. Every church read about the other church. Each church or each message concludes with this. It says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to what? The churches, plural, right? So the fact that they are addressed to the churches in plural and the fact that the problems identified within these seven churches are common to all churches at all time, down through the ages, I think makes it clear that these letters have a, what we call a universal relevance to all the churches of Christ down through the ages. And so if you didn't understand any of that, that's okay. Hopefully by the time we get through them, it'll be clear as mud to you in any way. So, yeah. so let me give you a couple of unifying markers concerning these letters. These letters follow a, what we call a common, a very common pattern. The first thing we see in each letter is that the letter is addressed to the angel of the church. Now, like I said a couple of weeks ago, I believe that these angels that they're addressing are not angelic beings from heaven. Right? I believe that he's addressing pastors and elders. Uh, these men, the word angel simply means messenger. Uh, these people, these angels are over these churches. These messengers are over the churches. Uh, we'll get in, uh, I won't get into how I come to that. Uh, I do leave room for, I could be wrong. 
all right, in that. But that's just what makes most sense to me in terms of how I read it and understand it. Second, each one of these letters, we see a description of the risen Christ that is taken from chapter 1. All right, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at chapter 1, and when John was receiving the vision, and he had all these identifying markers of the risen Christ, these descriptions of Christ that he was writing down and that he was seeing. Right? Well, those markers, those descriptions are taken from chapter 1, and they're put over into each of the, church, uh, of the churches in chapters 2 and 3. And so as Jesus introduces himself in these ways, he's doing something. He's both proclaiming his own matchless glory, he's proclaiming his own matchless authority, and he's announcing the truths of the gospel. All right, let me give you a couple of examples. When we see in chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus describes himself as holding the seven stars and walking among the seven lampstands, right? That's taken directly from chapter 1, verses 13 and, uh, verse 13 and verse 20. Go on down to verse 8. We see Jesus describe himself as the first and the last. We see that taken over from chapter 1 and verse 18. You can walk through each one of these churches, and we will, and you'll see a description of Christ taken over. right? And, and each one means something very uh, significant that we'll look at as we walk through. However, just understand that Jesus describes himself yet again in these, to these churches and what he is doing. He's not only proclaiming his glory. He's proclaiming very loud the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we'll see that. So this letter here, as we think through and walk through these letters, these letters are not just a list of do's and don'ts. Now, these letters are not just, <clears throat> you know, this is what you need to do and this is what you need to stop doing. No, no. These letters are that, but they contain what we call a very high Christology, right? And a very bold proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right? And so we also see some patterns, some common things in these letters. Words of rebuke and words of praise. We see the call to repentance, and we're going to see that over and over and over again. And we also see a reminder that Jesus is coming soon. And we see a promise to all those who will overcome. And so make no mistake about it. Jesus has something to say to these churches. And dear friends, he has something to say uh, to us as well through these letters. These letters that we are going to study, friends, listen, is very much God speaking to us. He is speaking to us not only as individuals. He is speaking to us through his word as a church. This, if I need to say it again, I would, this here is how God speaks to us through His Word, His all-sufficient Word. So we don't need to go out here and find any of these false and fake prophets that are running around town telling you all this stuff. You just need to come to God's Word and listen to what the risen Christ has to say to us. Period. This is where God speaks to us. And God has something very important to say to us as a church, as we walk through uh, these letters. And as we walk through them, we are going to be forced to look at ourselves and to ask ourselves and try to answer some very difficult, difficult questions. I don't know if you've ever got real deep into it, but it is, can be painful. We're going to have to ask and answer some very difficult questions. Questions like, is your first love still flaming? Or have you become lukewarm in your relationship? Are you ready, are we as a church ready to be faithful unto death like those in Smyrna? Or are we ready to hold fast and not deny the name of Christ like those in Philadelphia? Or maybe we have to ask ourselves, if we're like the churches in Pergamum and Thyatira, not that concerned with doctrine, not that concerned with what God's Word really has to say to us. And we kind of blow it off. And because of that, idolatry and, and immorality abounds. Maybe we have to ask ourselves those questions. Or if we find that we do have little to no concern for these things. Maybe it's because we're like our namesake, Sardis, thinking we're alive. When in reality we're dead tough questions that we're going to have to answer. 
So the question then becomes, where are we, right? Where are we, not only as individuals, but where are we as a church? You know, we've been told that Jesus walks among the lampstands. And we know the lampstands are the churches. Not just these seven, but churches throughout the church age. And what this means, that Jesus walks through the lampstands, what this means is Jesus controls his church. Friends, make no mistake about it. These are his churches here he's talking to, and this is his church here that we're sitting in today. This church belongs to Christ. It's not mine, and it's not yours. It is his, and he's going to do whatever he pleases to do with it. Later in this letter that we see to the church in Ephesus, Jesus in chapter 2, verse 5, he warns them that if they do not repent, that he will take away their lampstand. What does that mean? It means he'll shut it down. That means he'll shut it down. Some people say, well, it means that he removes his presence. Well, any place without the presence of Christ is not a church. It says that the, can- the lampstands are the churches. And if the church, the lampstand is removed, that means he's shutting the church down. By the way, the church in Ephesus doesn't exist today, by the way, just in case you were wondering. He'll close the doors. Why? Because they refuse to repent and return to their first love. Because they have decided kind of to do it their own way. To do what they want to do. To disregard what God has said in His Word. And Jesus shuts it down. Friends, let me remind you of something that we saw a couple of weeks ago. It's a very sobering reminder. Jesus Christ does not need us to accomplish His purpose on this earth. I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that. I know I do. He doesn't need us to accomplish His purpose on this earth. He doesn't need our church, and He doesn't need us. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, we have the absolute privilege of being able to work to spread the gospel, to advance the kingdom. We're here at His good pleasure. You're here at His good pleasure. The next breath you breathe is a gift of grace from God. I love what one preacher said one time. He said, your heart is beating at the rhythm it's beating at because God gives it its rhythm. And if he were to stop, so would you. We are here, make no mistake about it, at the good pleasure of God. And we have the pleasure of serving him. It is our honor to go and proclaim the gospel. It's our honor to advance the kingdom of God. And that God would allow us this privilege to serve Him. Dear friends, it's an act of sheer grace. And we need to thank Him that He allows us that privilege. You want to know why churches close and why they die every single week? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus removes the lampstand. That's why they do it. There are a whole host of reasons that may lead up to it. But at the end of the day, that's why they happen. And friends, listen to me. If it can happen to a church like Ephesus, it can happen to us as well. So for the glory of God, Jesus charges His churches to be zealous for the gospel, to reject false teaching and to reject false structures in the church and live in a manner worthy of the gospel, to live in a manner that reflects the gospel that we all say uh, we believe. And we need to be crystal clear clear on something here crystal clear on what jesus tells us we need to be absolutely sure of this that jesus promised in chapter 2 verse 23 he promised this that all churches will know all churches will know that i am he who searches minds and hearts and i will give to each of you according to your works That's a promise from Christ. You know, and again, as I was thinking through this this week, I couldn't help but wonder, what if Jesus wrote us a letter like he did to these seven churches? What might he say? What might he say to us? Well, maybe over the next several weeks, we might have an opportunity as we study through this to find out what he might say to us. Amen? As you bow your heads and close your eyes, we come to a a moment of invitation. 
And friends, as I was thinking about this and how to just offer this invitation, you know, Jesus does, definitely does have something to say to his people and to his churches. But if you're here today and outside of Christ, friends, he has something to say to you as well. And this is what he has to say. Repent. Repent of your sins. Bow your knee to Christ. Receive the free gift of grace that God is offering. Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. And he promises those that repent and those who receive that gift of grace that he offers he promises to forgive you not because of you and because of anything you've done because of what Christ has done Christ did it all on the cross he lived the life we couldn't live and he died the death we should have died also that someone like maybe you this morning would have an opportunity to hear a preacher try to make an appeal for you to come to Christ. And so I ask you today, would you humble yourself? Would you repent and would you trust in Christ as Lord and Savior? In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. We're going to ask you to come. Now understand, I say this every week, walk in this aisle, there's nothing magical about it. There's no magic prayer you can pray. It's all about the condition of your heart. And if the condition of your heart is one that truly is of repentance and humility, and you really, and God is dealing with you right now, and you're really sincere, He promises to forgive you. So I'm going to ask you to come. We'd love to have a moment to talk to you. Take as much time as we need. But for the rest of us here who are Christians, friends, listen. God has something to say to us through His Word, not only to us individually, but to us as a church. I'm going to ask you to do this for the next week and the next several weeks. Is just pray and ask God to prepare your heart for what He has to say. Because it could be uncomfortable. And so, Father, we thank You so much. For who You are, God, we thank You for the matchless grace that You extend. Father, I pray today for the one who may be here right now who You are dealing with, Lord. God, I pray that you would give them eyes to see, Lord, that you would give them ears to hear. Father, I pray you would give them faith to believe and then give them the courage of that conviction, Father, to come and to make their desire to follow you known. Father, we pray also for our church. God, we thank you for the incredible legacy that we have here. But Father, we do pray. God, that you would prepare us for the incredible legacy that you are going to have us to leave. So bless this time of invitation. May it be for your glory. May it be for our good, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I would just stand to your feet. <clears throat> I'll be seated for just a second. <clears throat> uh, again, thank you for your endurance and patience, uh, but I told you I had two sermons. Here's the, the second. <clears throat> Last week, we made some proposals uh, for the direction we 
hope and pray that God is leading us as a church. And I want to take a moment this morning here at the end of the service and just thank the many of you who have come and who have offered words of encouragement and, uh, and excitement really about what we are hoping God will do. I understand this and I understand it very clearly, probably better than most, change, any kind, can sometimes be very difficult, right? We all understand that. I certainly understand that. Change can be difficult even when it's obvious that change is needed. It doesn't make it any easier. And like we told you last week, when we made these proposals, we want to be as open and as transparent with you as we can and try to answer all the questions as best we can. Quite honestly, sometimes you have questions that we just don't know the answer to. And things will just have to kind of work themselves, work themselves out. But the one question that seems to get asked or is being asked more than most uh, is the question of the new ministerial position that was proposed. Uh, quite honestly, I thought the remodel would get all the questions. I thought the ministry part would fly through. Uh, but it seems to be a little bit of confusion, uh, uncertainty, uh, people not really understanding Things, uh, people are asking questions like, well, what's this person going to do? Or what's his responsibilities going to be? And thank you for your concern about what I'm going to be doing. And, you know, wondering how it's going to relate to me and all this other stuff. And so these are questions that naturally come up and, and ones I think we need uh, really to address. And so the way I want to do this this morning and trying to spend just a little bit of time with you, trying to explain not so much all the little intricate details of what the ins and outs are going to be for this position, but really try to look at it in a more broad view. All right, I want you to understand it from my perspective, and it's really a ministry philosophy uh, that I have. And I just want to share uh, that with you and how I think that fits uh, into our context uh, here at Sardis. So here's the thing you got to think. As with any vision, with any vision you have, you got to have the ability to see what's not there yet, right? Or better said, you have to be able to see past the current circumstance or the current situation. you got to be able to see past what's right in front of you and look beyond that, right? Think about it this way. It's like looking through a telescope, right? You guys know what telescopes look like. you got a small end and then you got a big end, right? Well, guess what? If you turn the telescope around and you look through the big end and you look out through the small end, you know what you're going to see? Whatever's in that little circle, that's all you're going to see. And it'll probably be blurry, right? But what happens when you turn that telescope around and you look through it correctly and you look through the small end out through the big end, what happens? Things open up, doesn't it? Things open up and you can begin to see things both far and wide. And things become a little more clear. So that's really what we're trying to do here. Look out past where we are. Look to where we could be. And look to where we pray and hope God will lead us. Like we said last Sunday, we have two main areas of focus here. Two main areas of focus as it pertains to ministry. That's the children's ministry and, uh, and the adult ministry. Okay? Now why these two? Well, these two go hand in hand along with the youth. All these ministries go together, right? You can't silo ministries. You can't say, well, we're going to have the children tucked way back here and, and forget about them. You can't say, I'm going to have the youth up here and forget about them. And then the, the adults will be over here and no, none of them never meet together. No, these, these ministries all go together. They all are intertwined and they all affect one another. When something happens in one, it's going to affect another ministry and so we can't silo things out and so when we think about the children's ministry if that's what we feel like is a weakness and it is right then that also means we got to think about other ministries as well because it's not in isolation and so we have to think about these ministries together if the children's ministry takes off if we do all this stuff and if it takes off and I say if because like I told you last week there's no silver bullets to this right there's no guarantees to any of this. All we're doing is tilling the soil and trying to plant some seeds, but it's God who gives the increase. And so we're going to have to pray and trust God with whatever He wants to do. 
And so, but if the children's ministry takes off and people begin to show up with their kids, we're going to have to have a plan and, uh, to prepare for the moms and dads who are going to be bringing these children. Why? Because these kids are not driving themselves, are they? They're not going to drive themselves, and we need to stop the practice of people coming and just dropping their kid off and leaving. We need to have an opportunity to minister to the moms and dads. And so the Sunday school, the adult Sunday school ministry department is just like the children's ministry, right? Just like the youth ministry, right? It's, it's a place where it needs to have experience. Someone who can run it, who can bring experience and training to it. There needs to be a clear and well thought out strategy for reaching and teaching and ministering to men and women. And someone, we need someone who knows how to run and implement these strategies to make that happen. It's a very vital ministry in our church. The adult ministry, listen, the adult ministry is the hub of the family, isn't it? It's the hub of the church. Uh, The adult ministry is where the other ministries literally gain life, isn't it? It's a very important ministry. This is why, you know, I call this position a family pastor. That may have gotten some people a little confused, but the only reason I'm calling it that is because uh, Eddie, if he gets this, he will be dealing with the most essential part of the family, and that's the moms and dads. Because here's the reality. As moms and dads go, so goes the family, right? And so we have to have something to be able to minister to them well and effectively. Now, if you're kind of old school thinking and you, you don't, the family pastor thing's kind of throwing y'all, think about uh, think about it this way. Think about minister of education or something, something like that. Maybe that'll help bring some clarity to what the position is actually going to be doing. Also, there needs to be in place a way as well as a person who can train and care for our teachers. Listen, <clears throat> these teachers, these Sunday school teachers, man, it is, a, it is a job. I did it for years. I had a job outside in the real world. I had a family to take care of. I was teaching Sunday school, so I assumed that responsibility. I mean, it was a joy. I loved doing it, but it was a job. It is an extra burden, and we need to make sure that we're training and caring for our teachers. Right? We're not just throwing them out there. What they're doing is providing a very vital service to the life of our church, and we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to care for them and to train them so that they can do their job even better than they're doing even right now. You see, here's the reality. Effective ministry, it doesn't just happen. You can't just throw anybody into it and expect it to happen. It doesn't just happen. It requires someone who knows and understands ministry and how to effectively minister and listen and how to pastor people. It's very, very important that we understand this. The vision for adult ministry will involve Sunday school as well as what I'll call intentional discipleship. And that's going to be something down the road. But that's something I hope to take the lead on. Jesus commanded us to disciple one another. And certainly Sunday school is a form of discipleship, but there's another form of it, a more intentional and intense form of discipleship that we need to be involved in. Because that's what Christ has commanded us to do. Well, this kind of structure in ministry, listen, it takes experience and someone who can be, listen, dedicated to implementing it. You know, I'm a huge fan, huge fan of Sunday school. Big fan of it. As a matter of fact, I believe Sunday school is the backbone of the church. Because it's in Sunday school, or small groups, ever how you want to say it. That's where people get connected to the life of the church. That's where people are going to be ministered to the best. Is inside that group of friends, of people that love them. Right? And so it's a very vital ministry to our church. And if the children's ministry begins to grow, guess what? Hopefully that means that we're also reaching moms and dads. And we're being able to minister to them as well. And so we're going to need a strong, well-organized adult ministry to accommodate this growth. Also, having a strong and well-organized adult ministry is going to help us with the assimilation of new members into the life of our church. What does that mean? That means we need to have a pathway for people who to take them from guest to active member. How does that look in the life of our church? What's the process for that to happen? Right? When a person comes in, do they, is, there, is it clear for them the, the path that they're to take? Or do they just come in and we get them signed up and we say, hey, good luck figuring it out? 
Find your way around. See, it shouldn't be that way. We need a pathway for, to assimilate people into the life of our church because when they're assimilated into the life of our church, they become active members and participators in the life of our church. But in order for this to happen, we're going to have to rethink how these ministries are led and how they're structured. Right now, we have, and forgive me, I know it's right before lunch, but forgive me for saying this, but we have kind of a constipated view uh, of ministry here. It's very, it's very tight, right? It's very hard to move and maneuver things around. We have so many committees that are in play here, and we have so many people who, who we just need to fill a spot, right? And we're wearing people out with that. We're wearing our people out trying to fill spots, and people are in positions that they really don't care to be in. They're just doing it because it needs to get done. And so what we're saying, we just need to kind of loosen that up some so that people will be free to serve God and the way they feel led to serve God. The way there's joy in the service. And so this installation of this position would mean that the Sunday school director, which is a volunteer position, uh, would go away. And this pastor, along with myself, would take and have oversight on the uh, structure of the adult ministry, over curriculum and over uh, training and caring for our teachers and over other responsibilities that will keep popping up, and they will, a bunch of them. All right? And so what we are trying to accomplish here is a comprehensive approach to this very vital and important ministry. Listen, Sunday school, Sunday school is a very strategic ministry in the life of any church. It really is. It's very strategic. It is wonderful for inreach as well as outreach, uh, assuming it's functioning as it's supposed to function. Assuming that it is functioning properly and we're getting everything out of it that we can. I would say right now we're not. We're not doing that. So let me just be as clear as I can. And again, I thank you for your patience. If this church is going to grow, this church is going to grow at all. Dear friends, listen to me. It's not going to happen because we got pretty buildings. Okay? That's not what is going to grow the church. If it grows, it will be because of how we minister to people, how we pastor people. Right? That's how it's going to grow. How we care for one another and for the people to whom God brings to us. You see, it's ministry above all else. It's going to cause the church to grow. It is the Word of God and how it is handled and how it is preached and how it is taught that's going to produce the disciples that we are commanded to make. And all buildings are are a tool to that end. Right? And so that's why we put these things together. Listen, this position that I'm advocating for, I'm putting my head on the chopping block here, man. I'm advocating for it as hard as I can. This position, just it may be new to this church. But friend, that doesn't mean it's not needed. It may not be the way we've always done it, but that doesn't mean it won't be effective. If the church decides to move forward with this, and listen, we're Baptists, man, so you got to say, right? You get a vote. If the church decides to move forward, it's what this is going to mean is that we're going to have another ministry that is getting the attention that it deserves. Samantha's handling the children, and she is killing it. She's doing an awesome job. Rich is handling the youth, doing a great job. And we'll have this position here, the adults, you guys, taken care of as well. And Pastor Eddie, if he gets this position with me, he'll be coming alongside of me and working side by side with me. And I have full confidence that he can do it. Full confidence that he can do it. When he comes to my office and we talk, man, he teaches me and he trains me. I love him. He'll be a great asset, as you already know. He'll be working with me to develop strategies for ministering to adults, uh, for recruiting and teaching teachers and other workers within our church. He'll be working with Samantha. He'll be working with Pastor Rich. And we'll all be working together to make sure that our church is ministering to families in the best way that we can. And just for the record, for those of you who may be concerned, I'll be right along there with them, doing it right with them. This is not me handing anything off to anyone or anything, okay? If anything, I'm taking the plate and I'm stacking more stuff on it, all right? So this is going to require more time and more work and more responsibility, not just from staff, but from every one of us. 
if it's going to work. It's going to require an all-in approach. Right? And even now, as we think about the adding things to our plate, even now, you can ask Rich. I've loaded him up already with extra responsibilities that are in addition to what he has to do with the, kid, with the, with the youth. But that's going to be true for every one of us, including me. And so when a ministry is not focused on, when, it, when it's not a priority, when a ministry just receives, you know, some leftover time that we have for it, friends, I promise you this, that ministry will cease to be effective. It will cease to be effective, and it will become greatly diminished. And again, I believe with every fiber of my being, now is the time to begin to look out beyond where we are. Look out beyond our current situation and plan and pray for whatever God might do in and through the life of our church. Because here's the reality, and I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm done. I promise. Hart County, our county, is growing. All the signs are there. And I was talking to a real estate broker in our county who was raised up here, lived here his whole life. I was talking to him about the growth that we're seeing. And he made this comment. He said this. He said, yeah, our little town has been discovered. <laughs> it's a great, great statement. Our little town has been discovered. If you go back and read some articles in the newspaper, the construction in Hart County doubled last year. It doubled. If you go out and look and you see businesses coming in to our community, right? These businesses are not coming in for no reason. They're not going to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get here and build buildings just so they can lose money. No, they're coming in for a reason. They know something's up. They've seen something. They know that there's an opportunity for them to come here and make money. Well, how are they going to make money? People. There are going to be people here uh, to, uh, for the, to be at their businesses. And we as a church, friends, listen, we as a church cannot wait until these people get here and start adjusting. Because if we do, if we wait till they get here, guess what? We've waited too long. And it's too late. But I'll tell you something. Most people, especially younger folks with babies and kids, they'll give you one shot, maybe two, but then they're out. It's just statistically true. It's just, it's just true. And I believe that as we sit here today as a church, as in our current situation, I believe we have a window of opportunity, a narrow window of opportunity, but one nonetheless in which to work. I think now is the time to start looking ahead and preparing the soul and trusting God uh, for the results of what He's going to do. If we were to implement everything I said here this morning, if we started it tomorrow, friends, you're still looking at a year to 18 months for any of this stuff to start really taking effect. These things take time. And so we can't wait. We just need to move if we're going to move. And listen, if you've got any questions... If you want to come and see me personally and privately uh, you know, and ask some questions about this, I'd love the opportunity to talk to you. Come on to my office. Man, I get here every morning. Most mornings, 99% of the time, I'm here at 6.30 in the morning for you early risers. And I leave somewhere around between 4 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, if that doesn't work for you, call me and tell me what does, and we'll make it, we'll make it happen. But I'd love to speak to you. Uh, about this. Also, if you got some more questions about the position, I believe uh, there's a few copies of the job description out there in the atrium on that table there in the center. Please grab one. Again, it's not all encompassing, but it'll give you a general idea of what's going to happen. And so there's my sales pitch. We'll know next week. Tomorrow's uh, next week is the vote, and we'll see where, uh, where we are as a church. But please, just know this. No matter how it goes, just know this, I want to thank you all so much for the support that you have shown to me and to my wife since we have been here. Uh, you guys have been uh, a blessing to us, and we thank you, uh, really, and sincerely thank you from the bottom of our heart. And I thank you for the privilege, and it is a privilege, of being your pastor. So thank you for that honor. So with that, I'm done. Pastor Rich. Come make a couple announcements and get them out of here. To, I know I've lingered. Uh, thank you, Pastor Michael. Uh, we will make this brief as possible. Uh, all of this is part of outreach, part of reaching our community. And so as a part of that outreach, we have made uh, these cards here. These are going to be uh, cards going out to our community, about 5,000 of them. 
This is a promotion for Easter coming up here soon in just a few weeks, including our sunrise service. And so we are mailing these out to people in our community, but we also have a supply here as well. And we would ask that when these come in, that you would be able to take a few of these, give to your friends and neighbors, and talk to them and invite them uh, to Easter service this year. We'd also like to remind everyone, too, as Pastor Michael mentioned, that there will be a called business meeting next Sunday. We very much encourage you to attend, and if you have questions, to ask him or any of the other deacons. Uh, lastly, as you open our bulletin, you'll see that there are a lot of things that are starting back up again, Bible studies, classes, groups, and so please make sure that you look over that and read it so you can know what's coming up and how you can be involved. Uh, the very last thing is our preschool is going to be having a very special program this Thursday night. And uh, we would really appreciate the help of some, some young, strong guys to help with the risers, uh, getting them in here, uh, here in just a few minutes. But at this time, let's pray together and we'll ask the Lord to bless this week. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you. We thank you for the exciting things that are coming to Sardis Baptist Church. And Father, we pray that it is part of your vision and part of your plan. Uh, Father, we're coming upon a season where people often come to church, uh, maybe for the first time or one time all year. And Lord, that harvest, God, uh, it is coming. And I pray that we would be ready to receive that harvest uh, with your Pastor Eddie and through the changes that are coming to the church. And that, Father, you would prepare our hearts for what that's going to look like. Thank you for Pastor Michael's message this morning for our, our special speaker about get the Gideons. And I pray that we would be uh, very much willing to give to that wonderful ministry. And we thank you, both of these men, for their time this morning. Bless us as we leave today. Amen.